All right, party people, what's going on? Your boy BQ. This is the most negative YouTube channel on the planet. You already know what it is. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review for June 6, 2024. I'm actually recording this on a Friday evening, hence I've got the lights going and all that. Usually I wake up very early on a uh, Saturday or a Sunday to do the review. But I got some time, man. I already watched the episode. Uh, usually it takes me a couple days to get it in the can, but um, I watched it the next day. I watched it Friday. You know, I don't typically watch it as it airs, but uh, I had the time today to watch it. And um, <clears throat> it was very much like last week. Uh, first half of the episode was awful. And then the second half was pretty good. That's pretty much the same exact formula that they used uh, last week. So if it's your first time here, I've always said from day one, it's the number one place to be for the uh, TNA fan. So consider the subscribe button if you dig what I have to say. This is an honest review. Everything I say, I, I really don't care who likes it or doesn't like it just because it's, I mean, I do care. I do care. I want people to enjoy the content. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, but I'm not trying to appease anybody. Um, I point out very often, this is not, not a Mark channel. This is not a Mark podcast. If you are that type of fan, like this really isn't the show for you. There are other podcasts out there that are going to, they're going to say, uh, you know, big con was incredible tonight. Um, they're going to, they're going to put over everything that the company did. Um, there are those podcasts out there. This is, this is not that I love TNA. I want to see it succeed, but I can recognize what's good and what's not good. If you're that kind of fan, then th this is the channel for you. I get comments still to this fucking day. You know, it, and the channel is negative BQ. It's kind of a joke. But it's also letting you know, guys, like, I'm not going to kiss anyone's ass. I get these, these comments every week. Stop being so opinionated. Just enjoy, enjoy the show. Enjoy wrestling. Like, here's a fucking secret. I'm a podcaster and I've been doing this for like 10 years now. Once you enter that podcasting space and you're stuck in it, you don't just watch wrestling and just fucking enjoy it. You're, you're going to dissect it and you're going to, you're going to say, Hey, this was good. This was bad. If I'm a little over analytical, that's my style. You're just going to have, if you don't like that again, there's, there's Mark podcasters out there that you can listen to. You don't have to be here. Like I, I put it out there all the time. If you're a fanatic, this isn't the channel for you. If you're someone who's a fan of the company, wants to see it grow, admits when something isn't good, enjoys when something is good, can see where you the company should make improvements and adjustments, I'm like, yeah, this for, this is for you. But this fucking just enjoy wrestling. This this isn't the ballet. Okay, this is not the fucking nutcracker on ice. I'm, I'm just gonna sit back and take it all in. I'm, I'm gonna enjoy, enjoy what I see in front of me. That's not what this freaking is. For all, for all my sports fans out there, the Mavericks just got their ass kicked by the Celtics, right? The game one of the NBA Finals. The Mavericks fan, and I think that Mavericks are going to win the series personally. And there's, I have a lot of listeners who are Mavericks fans, by the way. Um, and I know that from those of you I'm Facebook friends with and all that. Mavericks fans did not go home that night and say, oh, well, let's point out the fucking positives. You know what I'm saying? Uh, like a loss is a loss, right? So, and I, do, I open up probably every month, I open up a podcast talking about this. You know, to sit there and just like ignore when something, ignore an L, when you took an L, ignore a loss, ignore when something is bad because some other good things happened. It's just not, you know what I mean? Like that is, that is what fanatics do. Um, and there's just no place for that. So you leave Mark comments on my channel. Um, I'm going to ban you. And because I don't want my listeners uh, having to converse with those kind, those type of comments. My point in saying all this is just like, don't glorify bad shit. Enjoy good shit. 
don't glorify bad shit. I can't, I, I will not have that on this channel. Let's get into this episode though. Um, last week's podcast, I, I apologize. The quality wasn't great. Um, I, I've mentioned before, I do a lot on Microsoft Excel. I cannot have Excel up while I'm podcasting because it diminishes my podcast quality, my sound quality. I run Excel for my prop betting, uh, my own business, and my personal budget. So I have three, three different reasons that I use Excel. So it's always on my laptop. And when I was recording last week's episode, I kept telling myself, okay, I see Excel on there. Got to close it out before I start recording. And I didn't. And that does affect the quality. So I apologize. Hopefully it sounds a little bit better this week. Um, man, we got anything to talk about other than this um this episode. I still I'm not gonna lie, I still haven't really researched a whole lot in regard to the the firings and the res, you know resignations backstage. So that's why I don't have much of an opinion on it. My next mailbag episode, Mike Gilbert's gonna be with me. We're gonna uh both of us get in on that, and he's real good on that type of type of stuff. He really um he really has very good opinions and thoughts on what goes on behind the scenes. I don't care about the business of wrestling, which is weird because I have a business degree. Uh, I care about like my business, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, I, I do, I do just kind of watch the show. So for the people to just enjoy wrestling, just do, I just enjoy wrestling more than any podcaster, you know, trust me, I'm not in the dirt sheets. I'm not subscribing to Meltzer. I'm not subscribing to Sean Ross Sapp. You feel me? Like I am just enjoying wrestling, to be honest. I just watch it from a, a more um, analytical point of view than maybe some other podcasters do. But yeah, Mike's really good at that kind of stuff. Uh, we got a mailbag episode coming up. Got some good questions on there. It's the Impact Lounge Engagement Group on Facebook where you can submit questions. Uh, when we do that podcast, I will link the, the engagement group in the comments. Because for some reason, people are unable to find it on Facebook. They've been uh, searching for it, and it's not coming up for whatever reason. So, um, again, it's not a Mark group. Like, we get in there. We make fun of the product. Uh, we point out what we really, really like. But we we have fun in there. Like, it's not serious. Uh, if you get in there with, oh, well, you know, the opening match was good. You, you should really just enjoy it. Just shut the fuck up. Just don't even join the group. Just kicking it off a little negative today, a little little negative. Um, let's get into this episode, though. I don't think there was any other um, anything else I wanted to talk about. You know what? No, no, no. Let's talk Jordan Grace here real quick. I have no clue what's going to happen when she does her open challenge, and that's exciting. I was uh, I was very I was very much going with what I was told that. No one from NXT was scheduled to be on Impact, TNA, whatever, anytime soon. Okay? But then you watch the teases on on, on NXT. Um, There was also, the you know, obviously the Natty Nightheart teases we've talked about. There's so many possibilities. There's so many directions they can go. And I, I would really be shocked if it wasn't someone within the WWE bubble one way or another whether it's NXT, whether it's Natty, even if she's unsigned. But this just hit me. And I don't follow the NXT product enough. So so this might be, you know, nothing. But Cora Jade, is she still hurt? Is she like out for a long time or is she, is there a possibility she could answer this challenge? Here's why I say this. Because if it is someone from NXT, I don't think NXT is going to give TNA someone just for the sake of it. They need to find a way for it to be mutually beneficial. TNA has a much, much smaller audience. So how do you make it mutually beneficial? You bring someone back from injury. And now the headlines are reading this person returned from injury on TNA programming. And that's that falls into the realm of good marketing. Okay. So I wouldn't be shocked if it's, I keep using that terminology. I wouldn't be shocked. Someone from that TNA 
I mean, excuse me, NXT WWE bubble, but not someone that was teased. So you, so I was trying to look at that NXT women's roster and like that was the name that popped out and I'm like, is she, can she go? Does anyone know when she's going to be back? You know, so it's, it's exciting though. I really have no clue what the hell they're going to do. And again, I'm going to reiterate if it's Giselle Shaw, if it's yeah, Rosemary, they're going to lose so much goodwill with the fan base. Now we're going to get into this episode. The first half of this episode was not good. It wasn't good last week either. Was it 100% bad? Probably not. There's always some kind of redeeming qualities thrown in there. But that's been a strategy two weeks in a row now. Is The, the, the show is like prog- progressively gets better throughout the show. I understand that way of thinking. But the strategy that I think the fans have bought into, because you can't go balls of the wall from the beginning to the end. That's what AEW does, and that's why they lose viewership. Uh, when it comes to the last quarter hours, that's why it nosedives. You can't do wrestling like that. I get that. There's got to be a little comedy in there. There's got to be some lighthearted stuff. But the strategy that has worked is to start to show off with something people really want. We've called it the bookend strategy. Something good in the beginning, something good in the end. And you can put whatever in the middle. Okay. But when you start it off bad, you're going to lose people. You're going to lose viewers. And um, this kicks off with, I I laugh because the first thing it showed was Alicia Edwards saying, ew, when GM Miller walked up. But they're showing highlights from that system interview. And they're playing music in the background that doesn't even fucking fit the vibe of the the, the freaking angle. It shows Moose walking around backstage going, show yourself. Because he's looking for broken Matt. Show yourself. The camera pans to his right about four feet, and Matt Hardy is just standing there. Jesus Christ. Anyway, um, I just thought that was very bad. Um, and then it it uh it got into the show, and the first thing that we see is Khan. Now, I've said I don't dislike Khan. Do I think he's a a marketable superstar that I'd put him in the put him in the main event and put the belt on him and have him cut put uh, promos in the ring? No. I think for what he is, he's fine. Much like Ash by Elegance, because I was a fan once upon a time in the developmental, one of the original I shouldn't say one of the original NXT had so many different eras, but there was, there was the pack. I'm not pack, but sorry, Aaron Neville, Tyler breeze, you know, Tyson kid, uh, Sammy Zayn era, you know, that's where Dana Brooke came from. That's where Khan came from. And that was a really fun era. And I thought it was the best wrestling show on TV. And at that time I was watching everything, 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 everything. Uh, so, much like Ash, I'm, 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 you know, kind of unapologetically a fan of Khan, a little bit of a closet fan of Khan, okay? That being said, don't kick off your fucking episode with him. So Khan comes out. He's the first wrestler that we see. He is facing naked Jake. They bumped into each other the week before. Mike points this out, too. We've been pointing that this out for years that they're building matches off bumping into bumping into each other in the hallway. If you remember last week, Jake was talking to Deemer, Diener. Jake was standing there half naked, like he always is. Com- he's always dressed to compete. Uh, and and Khan just he easily can go around him. There's like at least like ten feet to his right that he could use, but he bumps right into him. It's watch where you're going. And then we get a match the next week. Can you imagine that in real life? If two people uh, bumped into each other, you know, like just, just say you're out, you're in the mall, some dude bumps into you and really pisses you off. And you say, I I will see you next week. You know, instead of like handling anything right then and there, let's, let's do this. What are you doing next Wednesday? 
You know what I'm saying? What do what are you doing at two two p.m. next Wednesday? I, that Wednesday I, that doesn't work for me. How about three? So we got Big Con versus Jake. Let me slip into something a little more comfortable. Tom Hannafin lets us know this is the first time ever matchup. He also let this let us know this wonderful stat for every single fucking match on the card. We were bullshitting with him on Twitter a couple months ago. He admitted he says it too much alluded to the fact that he would reserve it for main event matches and title matches. He is back to every single match on the card being a first time ever matchup con versus Jake. Who the fuck cares? All right. Reserve that for when it matters. I don't know what they brought up that con was looking for Santino last week. I have you know, I, even Tom was like, I don't know why he was. I don't know why he was either. Because Khan was walking around very pissed off last week. Santino! Walking through the fucking halls. Do wrestlers not have cell phones? Jake probably doesn't because he's not wearing clothes. But some of these guys that have pants and, and pockets, are you... Uh, Santino has a phone. They showed, they showed us he has a phone the, the fucking episode before. And now you got... You, you know, we have these wrestlers walking around backstage, yelling for Santino, who should be easily accessible as the authority figure. Uh, anyway, this match was what it was. It didn't advance anything. Diener didn't come down. Jake told him not to. Uh, I was thinking Diener was going to inadvertently cost him the match. Diener didn't come down like he would, you know. Um, Khan attacked him after the match because we do post-match angles after every match. And I think we all thought Diener was coming down, right? And maybe next week, Jake's going to be like, where were you to Diener? He's pro it's probably something like that's going to happen. He's going to say, well, you told me not to come. Eric Young was the com one who comes down. He quickly disposes and buries Khan and then cuts a fucking rah-rah speech. He is, I'm cursing a lot tonight. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't usually drink soda. Maybe that's what it is. He is now the official TNA Raw Raw guy. He is Adam Copeland. This is the third the third time he's come out and and cut a Raw Raw promo. He was on the winning side of the Champions Challenge. He has absolutely nothing to do. They got nothing for this guy. Just come out and get the crowd excited. That is it. That is that is uh that's all they have for Eric Young. So he is the official TNA Raw Raw guy. They've got a new transition going on between segments now. Um, it's like the, the logo is like huge. I think it's the TNA initials. I'm not sure. It's like huge. But it pans across the screen, and it's a very subtle whoosh. And it's, it's clean. It looks good. It replaces the old video game sound from the Impact Wrestling era that they did like 90 times an episode that was annoying as shit. And I kept saying, come up with something, you know, smooth and, and just subtle, you know? Uh, and they do this and it, and it's working. Uh, I was going to point out as well. So the production quality has been looking better. Uh, as I suspected last week's. So uh, let me, let's, let's start that over last week. I was reviewing the show and I said, you know, the shows have been looking better. This one does not look that good. The, the color correcting and all that back to back to not as bad as normal, but it wasn't good. So it worried me. And then we get this episode and it's just back to looking good again. So I, I, going back to what I always say, they cannot string two episodes in a row that look the same. You, cannot, you do not get two episodes that both look good. For some reason, they're going to fuck with one of them. And uh, I noticed that this week's looked just as good as it did two weeks ago. Last week, you know, the, the fucking with the sliders, everything's dark, everything's blending in together. So thank you, TNA, for getting back on track with a much better looking show. Gia Miller is with Frankie Kazarian backstage, and then the system walks up. They have made a deal because they, they pointed out, hey, Masha Slamovich made a deal with us. She's a champion. So they're trying to make a deal with Frankie Kazarian. You get a title shot if you take out Nick Nemeth tonight. Has this proposition ever worked in the history of wrestling? Like, can you name one time that they're like, hey, take him out tonight? And it's worked out. 
this is pro wrestling. Like, this is a wrestling match. Frankie Gazarian was not facing Nick Nemeth in a steel cage. It, it wasn't a street fight. There, it was a no holds barred. It was a one fall to the finish wrestling match. What is was he possibly going to do that was going to take out Nick Nemeth to where Nick Nemeth wasn't going to make it to? Uh, that's right, because they're wrestling for the tag team titles. I was going to say he was facing Moose, but uh, so that he wouldn't make it to against all odds. Has that ever worked out? Um, it, it is a storyline. I say a storyline. It's not a story. It's just, it's something that wrestling companies have done for years. Hey, take this guy out, scratch your back. I scratch yours. They, they never successfully take the guy out. It's, um, it's very played out. And, uh, you know, they're just trying to find a way to keep Frankie as relevant on the show as possible until Josh Alexander comes back, which I get it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not mad at that. Um, it shows PCO with the black rose. Gia Miller is interviewing Steph Double D Lander and tells her PCO gave what looked like a black rose. Yes, Gia, it was a black rose. And was that a love letter? Yes. Yes, it was. I can understand if you weren't sure if it was a greeting card or a love letter or a poem or, you know, who knows, right? The black rose, I mean, you need glasses if you couldn't tell it was a black rose. Zaya Brookside comes up and she's giving love advice. So the reason I'm saying that this was not good, the show started off horrible, because you're starting off with Khan, the self-proclaimed baddest man who's beat nobody since he's gotten that designation, that self, self-proclaimed self designation. He's beaten nobody. Gets buried by Eric Young. We get a rah-rah speech that everyone sees through. We move towards, you know, an angle that most fans aren't interested in. And I've 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 said oddly enough, I'm kind of curious to see how it plays out. But most fans are not interested in the PCO Steph Double D Lander love storyline. That that's just the nature of it. So they throw it very early in the show. Zai Brookside comes up. She's giving re- giving uh, relationship advice. They just wrestled last week. They were just trying to hurt each other. Now, when PCO, I mean, they showed that angle where he was holding onto the chair under the ring, which was really bad. But um, when when PCO came in the ring, I popped when Zai Brookside was standing in the entrance way, just a pig and shit watching this love story unfold in front of her. I popped for that. I thought it was funny, but I really like Zaya Brookside. Uh, and I like her accent too. But when they were having this, when they were talking to each other, I was thinking, I, I think it was um, Vince Russo, maybe who said this, one of my heroes that everyone has an accent in wrestling now. Like, remember it was so, uh, you know, it just, you know, you have a whole roster of wrestlers and maybe one or two had an accent. It, it feels like everyone has an accent now. A stupid accent that you can't understand, right? Um, so even though I didn't hate it necessarily, <laughs> most people did. Um, and, and Steph DeLander, who's a heel, is going to think about it. She says she doesn't really know him. I promise she doesn't know him. Nobody knows him. He's Frankenstein. Uh, she's a heel, but she's going to think about it. She's going to, she's going to sit on it for a week to see if she wants. if they have her go out with a date on a date with PCO on the show, uh, that's where it's going to nosedive. I hope that that is not the direction they go. I don't know quite what they're doing. I'm, I'm willing to give them a longer leash than I normally would give a segment that, or a story that looks like it's going to be bad. Don't go on a date. Please don't go on a date. Uh, Let's see. Did this show get any better after this? No. Giselle Shaw comes out. She has a new theme. I didn't know who the hell was coming out. I even saw the GS initials, and I didn't know who it was. She comes out, and if you didn't catch this, I think some of you did, though. Instead of Jade announcing her to the ring, they did a voiceover. Most likely what happened if in the live event, 
is that Jade announced her as the quintessential diva. I'm pretty sure. Like, I'm just using, like, common sense here, okay? She probably called her the quintessential diva. She's now the quintessential knockout. They're trying to baby face her up so she can't be a diva. She's she's a knockout. Most likely, Jade misspoke. So they did a voiceover instead. This was, like, months ago when Matt Raywald, they had him do a, a voiceover because they had to re-record something and it sounded horrible. This sounded horrible. This this did not sound at all like she was in the arena announcing her. No, I don't know. I'll take that back. The first half kind of did. And then the second half was clear that, you know, in post-production, they're like, hey, record this. And then we're going to put it over the, the track. So that, that's most likely what happened. And then Tom Hannafin, a couple times on commentary in this first time ever matchup, is letting you know uh, that... She's the quintessential knockout. Like they're, they're they're trying to they're trying to hammer that home. So she has a um this was a job match. It wasn't very good. This was not this for me was not the way to bring her back. Like she should have been a little more dominant. I thought I thought it went too long. This was a versus Shaza McKenzie. Now Shaza McKenzie is a veteran in wrestling. This is not a straight up job girl. By the way, every time a job girl wrestles on TNA, do not please stop tweeting TNA saying to sign this person. Anyway, um, it, it was a little too competitive for my taste. I don't think Shaza McKenzie should McKenzie should get squashed, but don't bring on Shaza McKenzie if you want to have a competitive match. Like if you're going to do a squash match, bring someone in no one's heard of. Have Giselle come and whoop her ass. If you watch Jordan Grace on NXT, she whooped this girl's ass. The girl did get some offense in. The girl could not work at all. She was horrible. But when Jordan was getting her shit in, everything was getting a reaction from the audience. And she was having fun. This didn't communicate what Jordan communicated in her match. Giselle Shaw was not out there having fun and having, you know, showcasing her her moves. It was a competitive squash. And I don't know that it it accomplish what they were trying to. Now, now that we know she's a baby face, I was hoping she was going to finally start using that corkscrew uh, splash off the top rope. I was thinking, okay, she's not using that move because she's a heel. She's, you know, this isn't AEW trying to pop the audience as a heel. Uh, but she went, she's still doing the running knee um, and gets the win. I didn't think it was very good. Just this first half of the episode, I was just like, what am I fucking watching? Then now it starts to pick up finally. We get the Rosemary video package backstage. This is very, very well done. And they are tapping into the version of Rosemary that everybody really, really likes. They're going back. They've gone a lot of different directions with her. They've gone heel. They've gone baby face. They've gone comedy, unfortunately. Try to make decay happen again. Didn't really feel the same. They're kind of going back to basics with Rosemary here. And I'm very interested in it. This is Rosemary at her best, like what they're trying to tap into here. Um, she can be a baby face without being goofy. You know, she can have some of that, which she, ha- which she had as a member of decay when she was a heel. She can have that and be a baby face too. That's the problem in wrestling is that companies don't seem to know how to keep an edge on somebody when they turn babyface. That's why Stone Cold Steve Austin worked because he he had edge no matter what they had him doing. He didn't go from, you know, a lot of guys are these badass heels and then they become a babyface and they're smiling and shaking hands and kissing babies. And it completely falls off a cliff and then people want him to turn heel again. So with Rosemary here, like, she can be a baby face, but she she doesn't have to do some of the borderline comedy shit that they had her kind of transitioning into. So I'm looking forward to what they do here. I'm just hoping she's not the one to open to answer Jordan Grace's open challenge. I'm telling you, that's in the back of my mind. Her and Giselle Shaw are just sitting there with ODB and um with throw uh, Madison Rain in there, but she's with AEW. They're just they're just sitting in the back of my head, like, 
waiting to possibly answer this open challenge. After this, we get Rascal, the Rascals versus Mike Santana and Macklin. This was pretty good. This was when the show, again, it starts, it starts picking up, and now we have a good episode on our hands. Here's my issue with this storyline, okay? It's not lost. It, there, there's, there's potential in it. But, well, I'm sorry. They, they didn't have the match. What was good was the, uh, I'm sorry, the angle that they had backstage uh, of Macklin coming in, talking to Santana. Like, this was good. This was well done. It's two wrestlers people care about. It's two wrestlers who are that come off as ba- as badasses on TV. They're kind of feuding with each other. Here, here is my problem with this. So Macklin is saying, let's challenge the Rascals next week for against all odds. I think it's next week, right? Santana is saying, I don't do that tag team shit, dog. All right. And Macklin is justifying, let's take these guys out and then we can do our own thing. We are back to, let's have a one fall to the finish wrestling match to take somebody out. So Macklin is saying, hey, you and I can fight after we beat the Rascals in a wrestling match. Now, if the Rascals win this match, that's different. Maybe Macklin who is always teasing these little baby face turns. Maybe he goes right back to his, his to being a badass heel again. Maybe he leaves Santana in the ring to get his butt kicked and he loses. Maybe the Rascals win and it furthers the heat between Steve Macklin and Santana. If that's what happens, or Santana and Macklin just can't get along and they lose the match for that reason, if that's what happens, I'm willing to give this a pass. If Macklin and and Santana win the match, which causes the Rascals to lose yet again, just to to just to say, okay, we beat the Rascals one to th- one two three. That clears the way for you and I to have a wrestling match now, and then they move on against all odds, or or it's not against all odds, right? Because that's where the tag match is. They move on to Slammiversary, have another one on one wrestling match. That's where it's a fucking fart in church. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat this. If the Rascals win, there's you can further the angle between Macklin and Santana to where there's heat between the two of them, and you can build that up until Slammiversary. If they beat the Rascals, that that's not creative, that's not a story, that's just an ex- we're going back to an excuse for these guys to wrestle again. They beat the Rascals, burying the Rascals in the process. And maybe bury is not the right word, but you understand what I'm saying. They're not winning a lot lately. You beat the Rascals in the process, and for some reason, beating them in a wrestling match means that they're never going to bother you again. That that opens the door for the two of you to have also have a wrestling match. That's where it's like Mark shit, okay? I want some heat. I want some story. So whatever happens here at Against All Odds, I hope this furthers the story into something we care about when Slammiversary rolls around. Then we get Cheeseball Fountain, which is Cheeseball, Mike Bailey, and Trent. I'll have a number seven with ranch and a delicious pie. Versus Champagne Sing, Campaign Sing, I'm sorry, and Mustafa Ali. This match caused me to become Bit of a campaign scene closet fan. I wasn't a big fan of his in the Desi Hit Squad. I thought the sh- the champagne stuff was a little better. I was kind of into it, even though Matthew Raywall was trying to tell you that all this money come- came from his family. No, he won the money in Vegas, if you remember the storyline. They tried to f- fit Sing into a couple round holes with a square peg, and it didn't work like they try to team them up with Steve Macklin that didn't work even with 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 uh Shira it just didn't it just didn't go where they were just too they were just two job guys this works this fits for him this is perfect him and Ali and they've they've tried different partners with Ali too this works they dress the same 
They look like a tag team. They could win the tag team championships. I can see that being a possibility. It probably won't. But you can see a world where maybe they're in the tag team division, depending on how long Ali is around. The reason I'm saying I became a, a bit of a closet campaign sing fan here was that, I mean, how long has he been in the company? It's, it has to have been about, be about four or five years at this point. Has he ever one time wrestled a competitive match to where he wasn't a joke or he wasn't a job guy? Has that happened? I, I don't recall that happening. I recall just knowing every time this guy wrestles that he's going to lose. I don't know what his finisher is. And no, I, I do. It's like some kind of gut buster thing. But I, he's using it in like sneak attacks. Campaign sync can work, folks. He had a couple moves in his offense that were different than some, what, you know, some of the stuff other people are doing. He was in the ring a lot. Mixing up with both of these guys. And he looked good. I was into it. I was like really into it. I was, I, I was, I, I was like, man, they gave this guy a chance. You know, because his matches are always what, like three minutes long. They're, they're, it's, it's always a joke. This guy can work. I was digging it. Tom Hannafin was telling us in his first time ever matchup that, um, the story was that that Mustafa Ali was running away from Trent Seven. Trent Seven doesn't beat anybody. So you're going to tell me he would rather be in the ring with Mike Bailey, but he was trying to avoid Trent Seven? I mean, that is a very old school wrestling thing where you're trying to avoid your challenger, and it 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 gives you a reason to for the match to be a little fresher when they do finally lock up. But trying to but trying to paint Trent, I'll have a number seven with a Coke and extra large fries. No ice in the Coke, by the way. Trying to paint him as some as someone that the, cha- the champion who's beat everybody uh, should be running from, should be scared of, is not believable. Not the, not the way they've used him and booked him. It just, he is a, a throwaway opponent so that they can eventually move on to Mike Bailey. Even, even you know, even Tom Hannafin had to point out that this was Bailey's home country or slammiversary, you know, like they're, they're laying that groundwork. We know that we're going to get that. We may even get it in the main event. I think we, I think we just might, but it, it's a silly story to tell. However, the story of this was was campaign saying I was into it. I think they should get Shira involved as well, uh, but they probably won't. That's probably probably a little overkill. I'm into campaign saying I think the name is hilarious. He can fucking work. The end was a little. Ali was gonna. I mean. Trent, I'll have a number seven, has him like in a torture rack type move. He's going to hit his finish. Mustafa Ali's going to come in to break up the pin, you know, not to break up the pinfall, but to break up the move. Trent, Trent the seventh looks at him, and Ali slithers out of the ring. Remember when Jake, when, when he was running from Jake something? He's running from Trent the seventh now. I, that, it's not believable. Both of his hands were in a, a compromised position because he was holding Singh over his head. Mustafa Ali could have kicked him in the stomach. A fan could have jumped out of jumped the rail from the third row, got into the ring, and still had time to kick him in the stomach. You know? Um, so I thought the 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 finish was kind of eh. But Cheeseball Fountain gets the win, which a, a, a rare win. Then we get Allison K, my girl versus Jordan Grace. I messaged her and I said, I thought you said you weren't doing any TV. And she said, Well, this wasn't booked at the time I talked to you. All good. I thought that this was going to happen at against all odds. And because it isn't, and they're doing the Jordan Grace open challenge, it tells me that this is probably, we'll probably ne- never, excuse me, never hear or see from the Hex again. Because uh, Marty Bell's wrestling next week. She's going to lose the Masha. I don't know why two heels are wrestling each other, but they are. Um, so, uh, 
that being said, they are not being booked like we're going to see the Hex stick around. Like we're going to see them wrestle for the belts, which is a, or be future champions. It's a, it's a such a huge missed opportunity. This is the best women's tag team division. I mean, not division, the best women's tag team out there as far as wrestling and as far as like a little bit of star power. You know what I mean? And a history with TNA. Like it just makes sense, right? So um, the match, though, I thought the match, the match was much, much better than it was versus Marty Bell the previous week. And there was a lot of shenanigans. Marty Bell kept getting involved. Um, I was really hoping they were going to drag this out and we were going to see the hex stick around. But as I communicated to you guys once before, Marty Bell lives there. She lives in Cincinnati with her boyfriend. And is, main, is most likely how they got this booking. AK and her are always together whether it's Michigan, whether it's Ohio, they travel a lot. You get one, you can probably get the other pretty easily. It worked out. I don't think we're going to see him going forward. Um, after the match with Marty Bell, maybe I'll ask uh, AK. I'm talking about the Marty Bell with uh, Masha match. After the set of tapings, I'll say. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens once it's in the book, when the books. Because if the, the tapings are in the books and they haven't beat anybody and they're just jobbing, I'm not even going to bother to answer the question because there's no way they're keeping them around. The crazy thing is they need them. They need them bad. But uh, we're not going to get them. But the, I thought the I thought the match was cool. We knew Jordan Grace was going to win. And um, moving on. We got a Sammy Callahan. Was it? what I just wrote, what the fuck is this? What, whatever he was doing backstage, like he was uh, breaking news and he had a, a fake news anchor and he's calling out Jonathan Gresham. I think it was called DMTV. What is it? Donut Man TV? Like, what? This was not good. But it's such a minimal part, you know, minute part in the show that who cares, right? As long as it's not like Sammy Callahan's going to do this every single week. What was interesting, too, is like, it's no, it doesn't matter what they do with Salami. Calorie ham, the bread machine. He say he comes off the exact same every single time. Like he's unpackageable. Un un what's the word I'm trying to say? Unrepackageable is what I'm saying. Like there's there's one version of this guy you get, and that's it. And you can try to change some of the pieces around him and, and the way the promos are delivered, but it, it is the same shit, and it has been the same shit ever since he's been a part of the company. So I didn't really enjoy it. But as long as it's this is just like a one-time thing, that's fine with me. I don't care. I asked this question last week about Jonathan Gresham. If they are so concerned about the health of individuals around him, remember referees got to wear mask and, masks and gloves, why don't his opponents have to wear them? Why is he wrestling, period? If he's getting people sick, why why have you cleared him to compete? Why have you not suspended him? He hasn't returned Santino's call, so it's just fuck you, and he's going to go wrestle anyway. I love Jonathan Gresham. I love the mask. I love the video stuff they were doing, the packages or the little, I guess you can call them vignettes, that they were doing. Loved it all. Loved it. The minute they, the minute they start trying to make him an octopus with the ink and the bad the bad selling from the referees and what about the wrestlers that have wrestled him previously? They they teased a couple weeks ago. Uh, man, I already forgot his name. The young kid that I said is really really good. He he was he looked like he was going to get sick a couple weeks ago, and he's not sick. You know, Sammy's not sick. Sammy wrestled him last week, and now Sammy's cutting a promo. So, is he getting people sick or not? Is it just refs? Are those the only people? They get infected with the sickness. Uh, who's the other one? Uh, Kushida's still out of action. You know, at least he's sick. He's, he's not back back wrestling. So, yeah, I didn't really like the salami stuff. But, again, if it was just this week and it was something silly they were doing, that's, I can live with it. If we're going to get this every time he's in a feud, I, I'm probably going to get annoyed very quickly. Then we got a first time ever matchup. 
AJ Francis versus Laredo Kid. It made me think about when Laredo Kid was supposed to wrestle Rich Swan a couple months ago on a pre-show. Uh, he was probably this was pro- he was probably going to beat Rich Swan and it was going to set this up. But then they someone was injured, someone didn't show up. I don't remember what the hell happened. They switched things around. But AJ Francis still got his title shot. He was not part of the champions challenge. He was not on the winning team. He just watched the match and was able to choose which championship he wanted to challenge for. And he chose the lesser of all of them, the digital media championship. The match was pretty quick and painless. We knew how this was going to play out. They tried to protect Laredo Kid a little bit by having Rich Swan get involved. We knew what was going to happen. We knew how this was going to play out. We knew that AJ Francis was going to win this thing. He's the new digital media championship or champion. They had some fellow by the name of BTE on the outside. It has a million subscribers or something. As I've explained to this, this to you many, many times, this is just to improve brand awareness to make the show look cooler. It's not because they're expecting, you know, this guy's million followers to watch TNA. The marks that I talked about at the top of the show, they think that they think if we get TikToker X and TikToker Y and they have 2 million followers between the two of them, that should mean we should get, that means we should get another half million people watching impact. Like that's the, that's the delusionals I'm talking about. I'm saying don't be on this channel if you if that's how you think. Don't be leaving comments if that's the type of fan you are. I don't want you here. I don't want my subscribers to uh, converse with people that think like that. Okay, this is just for the show to look cool, to sh- for the show to look like they're uh, rubbing elbows with people of status. That's it, and hopefully that leads to some growth. But there's going to be no immediate growth from that. I promise you. That's not how that shit works. But I'm all for them doing this. I like the way the match ended off with AJ Francis hitting the down payment, the choke slam. Um, And he's the digital media champion. If he cannot make this title entertaining, no one can. If he can't make it mean something, Nobody can. This title is probably going to be on TikTok. It's 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 probably going to be des- it's probably going to be like what it was initially designed for, or what we were told it was going to be. That's probably kind of what AJ Francis is going to do with it. It's probably going to be all over his social media. It's going to be all over other people's social medias. The problem is the title means jack shit, but it's brand awareness, you know, brand recognition. So that's fine. But if AJ can't do it, nobody can. And then get rid of the title. Let AJ Francis carry it forever, actually. If, if he ever leaves the company, have him take it with him. Like, don't I, don't I don't want him to lose this championship ever. They also said that Crazy Steve initiated this. And I, I recall this, that every time he wrestles, he will be defending the championship. So Laredo Kid is doing that. I, I like the concept because it's your way of trying to make the digital media championship like a fighting championship, and and I get it. When was the last time? And the reason Crazy Steve did this was because it was like a TNA Plus show where some of the champions were like in title ma- uh, tag team matches, not defending the titles, and Crazy Steve was like, well, I'm going to defend my title. This is all good, well and good. I have a question though. When was the last time we saw a fucking non-title match on this show? Maybe, maybe there was one. Maybe there's one two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a month ago. It wasn't memorable if there was. That's what I, I wouldn't be sitting here every month saying, "Hey, you don't have to defend every single title on every show, on every TNA Plus show." I wouldn't be saying that if there was non-title matches ever. So adding this like not stipulation, but just you know this thing where the digital media champion every time he wrestles he's defending the belt. They always defend the belts. I, I cannot think of the last non-title match that anybody has had on this on on the, in this company. Doesn't matter the knockouts, knockouts tag, world tag, the the world champion. I don't remember the last time we had a non-title match. First time ever matchup is Nick Nemeth versus Frankie Kazarian. I was a little tired by this point. 
but I recognize that they they put on a very good match. Uh, I I think I was tired because I knew where it was going. I knew it was like, hey, we're gonna watch a long match between two guys who can work, you know. So it wasn't it, it wasn't like, oh, this match was too long. I mean, it was enjoyable, but I knew where it was going. They're gonna have a fairly long match. Um, Nick Nemeth was gonna win, and the system were gonna attack him after the match. I didn't call the Joe Hendry part. I just didn't think that deep into it. I didn't care that much to think about that. But if I really sat down and thought about it, I probably would have said, and Joe Hendry is going to come out as well. Because the, the heels very rarely go off the air on top. And um, But they did in this sense. Because they did take out, you know, Ryan Nemeth comes down and, and, and Joe Hendry. And they did, they did take these guys out, okay? But then you go off the air with Broken Matt Hardy. And first of all, let me talk about post-match beatdowns. This is why they don't work. It's because if you think of all the great post-match beatdowns in wrestling history, they weren't using wrestling moves. Okay, like if you think of the Nexus when they when they took out John Cena and all these dudes once upon a time. I mean, they, they used some moves. But they were choking these guys out. They broke. They took the ring apart. They were whooping everyone's ass, right? These post-match beatdowns are like, let's hit the bus and knee party. Let's hit the spear, a DDT in the center of the ring. Like They're using wrestling moves. They're, they are not fighting. They're not trying to hurt them. They're using a bunch of moves that, in a best-case scenario, keep someone down for three seconds. They're, they're not, you know, sometimes they'll bring the chairs and all that. But they're not really like whooping these guys out. They, they, these guys, the Nemeth brothers, fucking uh, Joe Hendry, they're all wrestle next week. They, the Nemeth brothers are wrestling next week. Okay, so you you haven't really done anything to them, and they're wrestling ABC, which is ABC is going to lose. They're probably going to turn on each other. I mean, we're starting to see a lot of this shit, shit coming um, a mile away. But I, I, speaking of a mile away, I knew just without a shadow of a doubt that this match was going to end and the system were going to run down. They do this every single week. And I get it. You're trying to get the system on the show. I get it. Um, but I knew it was coming. And then they cut to Broken Matt Hardy. We're finally getting a Hardy compound thing. And I've been saying that the broken mat thing isn't working right now. It, it's moving no needles because they're making him wrestle. It's about the wrestling. It's not about the character. There's no story arc here. We, well, the problem is we, we already had the story arc for broken mat. Now he's already broken mat. But he's to the point now that he's just going back and forth between characters. Like we just knew him as Matt Hardy a couple months ago, regular Matt Hardy, and now he's broken again. The way Broken Matt would have worked, it's like uh, South Park, who, you know, when, when Kenny dies every episode. You have normal Matt Hardy, and then you break him. You find a way to break him. It probably requires some longer term stories, but that's what I think would work. People would be like, oh shit, bro Broken Matt's coming. Like we can feel it coming. But he just shows up and he's just broken because it's a goofy gimmick now. It's it's there's no uh, there's no reason for it. There's no rhyme or reason. It's it just a goofy. Um, I'm gonna wear this outfit and say ridiculous things. That that's what it's become. But at least we're getting the compound. He he um, invites the system out to the compound next week. We'll see what they do. There's no buzz or anything behind it. There's no build. It's not, you know, the the viewership's probably not going to go up. It was something they announced, something they announced at the very end of the show. I I, I have a hard time believing that it's gonna we're gonna get some bump in viewership, but I'm interested in it. I want to see what they do. Uh, I hope it's not too silly. It's okay to have some humor because this stuff is has been funny, but if you go back to the final deletion. Um, it was funny because it was just so off the wall, but it wasn't goofy. They weren't trying to be, um, to be, to act ridiculous. Now, as that gimmick progressed, it 
it got silly as shit. It became comedy. <laughs> it wasn't dark like it was before. I expect this to be more comedy than darkness. But at least we're not just relying on, on Matt Hardy to wrestle matches. You know? Um, so they got a pretty decent looking card for next week. And uh, we're getting this. So th this is what people are going to be interested in. But I don't think they did enough to... Um, you know, to get the non-fans to tune in. I think it, I think it's just something that us who already watch the show are going to see and no one else is going to see it. It's not branded as anything big. It's just, I invite you and your family to my compound, you know, to come see me and my family. I mean, the, the system is three grown men and a grown woman. Matt Hardy's side of the family is a 70-year-old man, his non-wrestling wife, and his three kids. I'm envisioning... Um, I'll say a spot for the la for a lack of better term. I'm envisioning spots where his kids are firing off stuff at the wrestlers. I I'm gonna tell you what I what I envision. Actually, I envision Home Alone. If you guys remember the movie Home Alone, if you're my age, you definitely know it. And it's the robbers coming into the house and they're falling for a bunch of silly booby traps. That's what I'm envisioning. This is next week if his kids are involved in this and then the you know senior benjamin and all that i'm envisioning um a goofy version of home alone not it, it's going to be I, I guarantee you it's gonna be closer to ho goofy home alone than it is to the final deletion I, I bet my life on that so we'll see i'm kind of excited for it i hope that it surprises me i hope that it's much better than i think it's going to be I hope that it does get a genuine pop out of me. I've, I've always said my favorite match that I've ever been anywhere for live, and I've seen The Undertaker live. I've seen Ric Flair. I've seen Brock Lesnar. I saw, I, I've brought this up many times. I, I saw The Shield when they all won the titles the first night. I saw when The Shields lost their titles to Cody Rhodes and Dustin. And I mean, when I say saw, I mean, I was there. I was there live. You know, I have, um, I've been there for a lot. TNA wise, I was there when Eddie Edwards beat Lashley for the title. I was there when Drew Galloway cashed in and beat Matt Hardy, you know, big money Matt for the title. Uh, I've seen some cool things. I've, I've, and uh, as a kid and at an Angels game versus the Royals, I saw George Brett's 3000th hit. Um, man, what else? I, I've, I've just, I've, I've seen some awesome shit. I've seen buzzer beaters in sports, you know. Um, the funnest <laughs> I've, I've, I'm rambling and rambling. The funnest thing I ever was there live for was that freaking uh, the uh, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was Decay versus the Hardys at Bound for Glory. It was whatever match they did, it wasn't the final deletion, it was whatever they called it. I don't remember what it was. I'm, I'm trying to tell you how memorable it was, and I don't remember the name. That match that the Decay did versus the Hardys, I was laughing. I was, I was popping, popping, lock and drop. I was crying. It, it, it was. It got all these emotions out of me. I had a freaking blast watching it. It was one of the coolest. Just, I, I will never forget where it cuts to Abyss and Broken Matt hitting each other outside the Universal Studios sign. The place went crazy for it. We we didn't know what to expect. It was in the ring. It was out of the ring. It the match was so ahead of its time back then, and uh, I'll never forget it. it. It was so so entertaining. Um, I don't think that's what this is going to be. Unfortunately, I want to see it. I want to see that, but I don't think that's what it's going to be. That's going to do it for me. I'm I'm right here at that uh that hour mark. I'm getting ready to to hit that. So. Um, hopefully the review wasn't too negative for a lot of you. As I said, it just, we got two weeks in a row, mainly bad television for an hour. And then all of a sudden it picks up and it's, it's significantly better after that. So, uh, that'll do it for me, folks. I am your boy BQ. I will catch you next week. Hope you enjoyed me actually reviewing the show a lot earlier than I normally do. I'm out though. Peace.